Chapter 41, Apostasy at the Jordan. This chapter is based on Numbers 25. With joyful hearts and renewed faith in God, the victorious armies of Israel had returned from Bashan. They had already gained possession of a valuable territory, and they were confident of the immediate conquest of Canaan. Only the river Jordan lay between them and the promised land. Just across the river was a rich plain, covered with verdure, watered with streams from copious fountains, and shaded by luxuriant palm trees. On the western border of the plain rose the towers and palaces of Jericho, so embosomed in its palm tree groves that it was called the City of Palm Trees. On the eastern side of Jordan, between the river and the high tableland which they had been traversing, was also a plain, several miles in width and extending some distance along the river. This sheltered valley had the climate of the tropics. Here flourished the Shittim, or Acacia tree, giving to the plain the name Vale of Shittim. It was here that the Israelites encamped, and in the acacia groves by the riverside they found an agreeable retreat. But amid these attractive surroundings, they were to encounter an evil more deadly than mighty hosts of armed men or the wild beasts of the wilderness. That country, so rich in natural advantages, had been defiled by the inhabitants. In the public worship of Baal, the leading deity, the most degrading and iniquitous scenes were constantly enacted. On every side were places noted for idolatry and licentiousness, the very names being suggestive of the vileness and corruption of the people. These surroundings exerted a polluting influence upon the Israelites. Their minds became familiar with the vile thoughts constantly suggested. Their life of ease and inaction produced its demoralizing effect and almost unconsciously to themselves they were departing from God and coming into a condition where they would fall an easy prey to temptation. During the time of their encampment beside Jordan, Moses was preparing for the occupation of Canaan. In this work the great leader was fully employed, but to the people this time of suspense and expectation was most trying, and before many weeks had elapsed, their history was marred by the most frightful departures from virtue and integrity. At first, there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors. But after a time, Midianitish women began to steal into the camp. Their appearance excited no alarm, and so quietly were their plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women, in their association with the Hebrews, to seduce them into transgression of the law of God, to draw their attention to heathen rites and customs, and lead them into idolatry. These motives were studiously concealed under the garb of friendship, so that they were not suspected, even by the guardians of the people. At Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab, and it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God, and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. Great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. They ventured upon the forbidden ground, and were entangled in the snare of Satan. Beguiled with music and dancing, and allured by the beauty of heathen vestals, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah. As they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence in wine beclouded their senses, and broke down the barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway, and having defiled their consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. It was not long before the poison had spread, like a deadly infection, through the camp of Israel. Those who would have conquered their enemies in battle were overcome by the wiles of heathen women. The people seemed to be infatuated. The rulers and the leading men were among the first to transgress, and so many of the people were guilty that the apostasy became national. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. When Moses was aroused to perceive the evil, the plots of their enemies had been so successful that not only were the Israelites participating in the licentious worship at Mount Peor, but the heathen rites were coming to be observed in the camp of Israel. 
the aged leader was filled with indignation, and the wrath of God was kindled. Their iniquitous practices did that for Israel, which all the enchantments of Balaam could not do. They separated them from God. By swift coming judgments, the people were awakened to the enormity of their sin. A terrible pestilence broke out in the camp, to which tens of thousands speedily fell a prey. God commanded that the leaders in this apostasy be put to death by the magistrates. This order was promptly obeyed. The offenders were slain. Then their bodies were hung up in sight of all Israel, that the congregation, seeing the leaders so severely dealt with, might have a deep sense of God's abhorrence of their sin and the terror of His wrath against them. All felt that the punishment was just, and the people hastened to the tabernacle and with tears and deep humiliation confessed their sin. While they were thus weeping before God at the door of the tabernacle, while the plague was still doing its work of death, and the magistrates were executing their terrible commission, Zimri, one of the nobles of Israel, came boldly into the camp accompanied by a Midianitish harlot, a princess of a chief house in Midian, whom he escorted to his tent. Never was vice bolder or more stubborn. Inflamed with wine, Zimri declared his sin as Sodom, and gloried in his shame. The priests and leaders had prostrated themselves in grief and humiliation, weeping between the porch and the altar, and entreating the Lord to spare his people, and give not his heritage to reproach, when this prince in Israel flaunted his sin in the sight of the congregation, as if to defy the vengeance of God and mock the judges of the nation. Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the high priest, rose up from among the congregation, and seizing a javelin, he went after the man of Israel into the tent and slew them both. Thus the plague was stayed, while the priest who had executed the divine judgment was honored before all Israel, and the priesthood was confirmed to him and to his house forever. Phinehas hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, was the divine message. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made an atonement for the children of Israel. The judgments visited upon Israel for their sin at Shittim destroyed the survivors of that vast company, who nearly forty years before had incurred the sentence, They shall surely die in the wilderness. The numbering of the people by divine direction during their encampment on the plains of Jordan showed that of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, there was not left a man of them, save Caleb the son of Jephina, and Joshua the son of Nun. Numbers chapter 26 verses 64 and 65. God had sent judgments upon Israel for yielding to the enticements of the Midianites, but the tempters were not to escape the wrath of divine justice. The Amalekites who had attacked Israel at Rephidim, falling upon those who were faint and weary behind the host, were not punished till long after. But the Midianites who seduced them into sin were speedily made to feel God's judgments as being the more dangerous enemies. Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Numbers chapter 31 verse 2 was the command of God to Moses. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. This mandate was immediately obeyed. One thousand men were chosen from each of the tribes and sent out under the leadership of Phinehas. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain. Five kings of Midian, Balaam also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. Verses 7 and 8. The women also who had been made captives by the attacking army were put to death at the command of Moses as the most guilty and most dangerous of the foes of Israel. Such was the end of them that devised mischief against God's people. Says the psalmist, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Psalm 9, verse 15. For the Lord will not cast off his people, 
neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness. When men gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous, the Lord shall bring upon them their own iniquity, and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Psalm 94, verses 14, 15, 21, and 23. When Balaam was called to curse the Hebrews, he could not, by all his enchantments, bring evil upon them. For the Lord had not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. Numbers chapter 23, verses 21 and 23. But when through yielding to temptation they transgressed God's law, their defense departed from them. When the people of God are faithful to his commandments, there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. Hence all the power and wily arts of Satan are exerted to seduce them into sin. If those who profess to be the depositaries of God's law become transgressors of its precepts, they separate themselves from God, and they will be unable to stand before their enemies. The Israelites, who could not be overcome by the arms or by the enchantments of Midian, fell a prey to her harlots. Such is the power that woman, enlisted in the service of Satan, has exerted to entrap and destroy souls. She hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Proverbs chapter 7 verse 26 It was thus that the children of Seth were seduced from their integrity, and the holy seed became corrupt. It was thus that Joseph was tempted. Thus Samson betrayed his strength, the defense of Israel, into the hands of the Philistines. Here David stumbled. And Solomon, the wisest of kings, who had thrice been called the beloved of his God, became a slave of passion, and sacrificed his integrity to the same bewitching power. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 and 12 Satan well knows the material with which he has to deal in the human heart. He knows, for he has studied with fiendish intensity for thousands of years the points most easily assailed in every character, and through successive generations he has wrought to overthrow the strongest men, princes in Israel, by the same temptations that were so successful at Baal Peor. All along through the ages there are strewn wrecks of character that have been stranded upon the rocks of sensual indulgence. As we approach the close of time, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. He lays his snares for every soul. It is not the ignorant and uncultured merely that need to be guarded. He will prepare his temptations for those in the highest positions, in the most holy office. If he can lead them to pollute their souls, he can through them destroy many. And he employs the same agents now as he employed three thousand years ago. By worldly friendships, by the charms of beauty, by pleasure-seeking, mirth, feasting, or the wine cup, he tempts to the violation of the seventh commandment. Satan seduced Israel into licentiousness before leading them to idolatry. Those who will dishonor God's image and defile his temple in their own persons will not scruple at any dishonor to God that will gratify the desire of their depraved hearts. Sensual indulgence weakens the mind and debases the soul. The moral and intellectual powers are benumbed and paralyzed by the gratification of the animal propensities. And it is impossible for the slave of passion to realize the sacred obligation of the law of God, to appreciate the atonement, or to place a right value upon the soul. Goodness, purity, and truth, reverence for God, and love for sacred things, all those holy affections and noble desires that link men with the heavenly world are consumed in the fires of lust.
the soul becomes a blackened and desolate waste, the habitation of evil spirits, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Beings formed in the image of God are dragged down to a level with the brutes. It was by associating with the idolaters and joining in their festivities that the Hebrews were led to transgress God's law and bring his judgments upon the nation. So now it is by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly and unite in their amusements that Satan is most successful in alluring them into sin. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 God requires of His people now as great a distinction from the world in customs, habits, and principles as He required of Israel anciently. If they faithfully follow the teachings of His Word, this distinction will exist. It cannot be otherwise. The warnings given to the Hebrews against assimilating with the heathen were not more direct or explicit than are those forbidding Christians to conform to the spirit and customs of the ungodly. Christ speaks to us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James chapter 4, verse 4. The followers of Christ are to separate themselves from sinners, choosing their society only when there is opportunity to do them good. We cannot be too decided in shunning the company of those who exert an influence to draw us away from God. While we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are to shun temptation so far as possible. It was when the Israelites were in a condition of outward ease and security that they were led into sin. They failed to keep God ever before them. They neglected prayer and cherished a spirit of self-confidence. Ease and self-indulgence left the citadel of the soul unguarded, and debasing thoughts found entrance. It was the traitors within the walls that overthrew the strongholds of principle and betrayed Israel into the power of Satan. It is thus that Satan still seeks to compass the ruin of the soul. A long preparatory process, unknown to the world, goes on in the heart before the Christian commits open sin. The mind does not come down at once from purity and holiness to depravity, corruption, and crime. It takes time to degrade those formed in the image of God to the brutal or the satanic. By beholding, we become changed. By the indulgence of impure thoughts, man can so educate his mind that sin, which he once loathed, will become pleasant to him. Satan is using every means to make crime and debasing vice popular. We cannot walk the streets of our cities without encountering flaring notices of crime presented in some novel, or to be acted at some theater. The mind is educated to familiarity with sin. The course pursued by the base and vile is kept before the people in the periodicals of the day, and everything that can excite passion is brought before them in exciting stories. They hear and read so much of debasing crime that the once tender conscience, which would have recoiled with horror from such scenes, becomes hardened, and they dwell upon these things with greedy interest. Many of the amusements popular in the world today, even with those who claim to be Christians, tend to the same end as did those of the heathen. There are indeed few among them that Satan does not turn to account in destroying souls. Through the drama he has worked for ages to excite passion and glorify vice. The opera, with its fascinating display and bewildering music, the masquerade, the dance, the card table, Satan employs to break down the barriers of principle and open the door to sensual indulgence. In every gathering for pleasure where pride is fostered or appetite indulged, where one is led to forget God and lose sight of eternal interests, there Satan is binding his chains about the soul. Keep thy heart with all diligence, is the counsel of the wise man, for out of it are the issues of life. 
Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. As man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. The heart must be renewed by divine grace, or it will be in vain to seek for purity of life. He who attempts to build up a noble, virtuous character, independent of the grace of Christ, is building his house upon the shifting sand. In the fierce storms of temptation it will surely be overthrown. David's prayer should be the petition of every soul. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, verse 10 And having become partakers of the heavenly gift, we are to go on unto perfection, being kept by the power of God through faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 Yet we have a work to do to resist temptation. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind should not be left to wonder at random upon every subject that the adversary of souls may suggest. Girding up the loins of your mind, says the Apostle Peter, be sober, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance, but like as he which called you is holy, be ye yourselves also holy in all manner of living. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, in the Revised Version. Says Paul, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. This will require earnest prayer and unceasing watchfulness. We must be aided by the abiding influence of the Holy Spirit, which will attract the mind upward and habituate it to dwell on pure and holy things. And we must give diligent study to the Word of God. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11. Israel's sin at Beth Peor brought the judgments of God upon the nation, and though the same sins may not now be punished as speedily, they will as surely meet retribution. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Nature has affixed terrible penalties to these crimes, penalties which, sooner or later, will be inflicted upon every transgressor. It is these sins, more than any other, that have caused the fearful degeneracy of our race, and the weight of disease and misery with which the world is cursed. Men may succeed in concealing their transgression from their fellow men, but they will no less surely reap the result in suffering, disease, imbecility, or death. And beyond this life stands the tribunal of the judgment with its award of eternal penalties. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but with Satan and evil angels shall have their part in that lake of fire which is the second death. Galatians chapter 5 verse 21 and Revelation chapter 20 verse 14. The lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Verses 8 to 11. Her house inclineth unto death. None that go unto her return again. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Her guests are in the depths of hell. 
Proverbs chapter 9, verse 18.